Hi everyone, this is Dave Vellante and we're about to go on the road for pretty much the rest of the spring. Events are back and theCUBE is in very high demand covering all things enterprise tech, cloud, infrastructure, AI of course is part of every discussion. And we've been working on a new mental model for data. The premise goes something like this. Applications are moving from being process centric to data centric, meaning rather than data being locked inside of apps in silos, the business logic is going to be embedded in the data and organizations are going to build data apps on top of that. And the example we use is Uber. When you call a ride share, the data app maps a rider to a driver, it calculates a route, a destination, an ETA, et cetera. And each of these items, you can think of it as a data element or a data product even. Now, the interesting thing is these data elements are all coherent. They're a coordinated set of data products that together create a series of actions and an outcome. And to make that happen, the data elements need a semantic layer that creates this coherency. Now, at scale was one of the first, if not the first independent semantic layer for data and analytics. And over the past few years, we've seen a surge in interest at the company. And we're really pleased to welcome investor, entrepreneur, and my friend, Chris Lynch, the executive chairman and CEO of AtScale, back to theCUBE. Hello, Chris, what's happening? Hey, Dave, how are you? Good, good. What's new in your life? You've been traveling like crazy. That's not, not new, I guess, but what's been going on out there? Where you, where you been? I'm, tra I'm traveling quite a bit, but before we jump in, and we are friends, but um, I still have to correct you. Um, we are the first and the only universal semantic layer, right? So there are semantic layers, but you have to take all your data and put it in this proprietary stack and it's very limited in its function. Dave Mariani had the vision to invent this technology almost 10 years ago. And the rest of the world's caught up with us. So the power of what you just said is, is if you have an independent semantic layer that is sort of horizontal across any place, any stovepipe, any cloud, any whatever, that becomes really the point of coherency per my upfront wrap. Um, I would imagine that threatens a lot of people because if you succeed in getting people to adopt that, then, you know, people are going to have to kiss your ring. Well, you know about my famous ring. <laughs> no, tell me about the ring. I mean, I've seen the ring, but I don't know the story behind it. You don't know the story of this? No, what's the story behind that ring? So I purchased this from Barmakian's Jewelers, one of the oldest jewelers in I think the country, long story short, there was this short guy, shorter than me from South Boston that did business with them. And he had this made, and while it was being made, he had to amp spray. He had to get out of, the, out of town, out of the country. And long story short, he never came back for it. And it sat there for like 10 years. And um, the guy's my neighbor, and we're having a couple glasses of wine one night. He said, I've got this thing in my vault. I cannot sell it because everyone thinks it's bad karma. You're the guy that could pull it off. So he brings it home. I see it and I, I always used to wear a clattering and I like what it stands for. Friendship, love, and loyalty, things that are important to me. And um, I saw this thing and I'm like, yeah, I'll wear it. And what was amazing was this thing, I could put it on my thumb loosely. So this person who was shorter than me must have had hands like a gorilla. So wait. So I'll let you figure out who it was. Show, 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 show the camera, put it in front of the camera so we can see this thing. It's a little higher. Yeah, oh wow, look at that. Can you guys get that? Oh, that's good. I don't know why that's, that's bad karma. I mean, it's, it's friendship, family, yeah, love. I, I don't think, karma. no, not, not, not a clattering, but the person that this was made for. <laughs> oh, got it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just going to leave it there. So, okay. Yeah. So you've been traveling around. You're going to um, London next, right? Yes. Tech, tech Tackles Cancer London. I was there last summer. It was awesome. I mean, really amazing event. Give a, give a quick plug for that. Sure. So May 24th, we will be in London at the Omera, 
O-M-E-R-A. It's a club owned by Mum the Mumford's and Mumford and Sons, the band, and they've graciously provided us the venue. And, um, you know, every year we try to raise a million bucks in a night uh, for pediatric cancer research. And, you know, this will be no different. We've got a show coming up in September in Boston, but we've decided because it's a global charity and initiative that we're going to take it on the road. So this is the first of many shows we'll do throughout Europe and the rest of the world. And the idea is to go to every major city around the world and um, educate people um, on the, the, the issue of pediatric cancer and raise money to solve the problem. And, and for people who don't know, Tech Tackles Cancer is an amazing uh, uh, charity that you guys have really done a, a wonderful job with. It's billed as uh, live karaoke, but it's really more than that. It's actually live bands. The tech community comes together. I, I participated, well, just as, a, <laughs> as an audience member last summer, it was incredible. I mean, I, I gotta say, I thought Duplessis, Steve Duplessis was outstanding. He did Mustang Sally. I thought Ken Steinhardt was up there sort of solo doing Eddie Van Halen and, yeah. and, and singing. You were up there, you, you had me until you took your shirt off and then you scared the crap out of me. <laughs> You're a madman. But really a, a great cause and a lot of people there, really wonderful supporters. I didn't know you did it in London. That's awesome. Is it the first time you do it in London? Yes, this, this is the first time outside the US. And, and the goal is that we'll hit every NFL city in the US, but we're going to expand to major cities around the globe. And this, and this is the first. So this is sort of the inaugural event outside the US. Wow, congratulations. Um, all right, let's get into it. So you guys had this, uh, your Semantic Layer Summit um, recently. I'm still absorbing the content from it. And we've had a couple of meetings uh, with, with Josh at AtScale and Dave, and he's like, I mean, so over my head, but I take good notes. Um, and, and the content was really, really good. You had a big crowd there, like 10,000 people, I think you had um, between physical and online. What, so you started to talk about the semantic layer and the status, you're the only independent. How do you look at the semantic layer market? It's esoteric to some people. I think people are like, well, what is that? Why do you need it? Explain how you think about the current market and the status. Sure. So obviously, when I say that you know we we are the only universal semantic layer, um, what I mean is we're multi-cloud, we're multi-vendor, and we support on-prem as well as cloud. So we can deliver the value of the semantic layer in any of those forms. So that that's point one, and no one else on the planet can do that. Period. End of story. With respect to the functionality, we have the ability to create one logical view of all your data and any data that you have the ability to work with that could be outside of your organization. And we create one logical view. It can live wherever it lives. And that delivers the power of all of an enterprise's data, of all supply chains data and ecosystems data in a governed, performant way that leads to new and interesting actionable insights. When I say actual insights, I'm talking about multi-dimensional analysis. I'm talking about this semantic layer, this logical view being the bridge between BI and AI and back. As you, as you know, because I know your lineage and we go back this far because we're both old. EMC, Dick Egan had a saying that I stole and, and contemporized for 2023. You probably remember the posters. It's about the software, stupid. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, as you probably already already also know, our largest individual investor is the Egan family. So, with their permission and blessing, I took Dick Egan's prophetic saying, and I and I've made it my own. It's about the data, stupid. 
It is about the data. And of course, that's a reference, go, go back to when Bill Clinton beat uh, George Bush the elder uh, for the presidency. Uh, that was their saying, it's the, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, James Carville was his sort of advisor. And so, you know, applying that to yep. data is right on. So, so let me tell you what I mean by it. And I'm the founding investor, as you know, of Data Robot. Yep. A groundbreaking auto ML company, undeniably. With that said, it's not about the algorithm. The ability to create step functions and value from data is about being able to assimilate the data with business context. That's what a semantic layer does. The more data you get, the more insight you get, the more value you get. There's a marginal return on optimizing an algorithm to the 0.0000% the step functions and value in bringing new data to those algorithms. That's what we do. One logical view, we auto engineer that data into the models, that feature, that feature store is built and we publish to every BI tool from Excel to Tableau to Power BI, we don't care. So what's the significance? Now business analysts have the power of all an enterprise's data. Now Tableau, Excel, whatever BI tool you use is AI powered. And that's how you're gonna democratize AI. Not by teaching people Python, not by trying to create more data scientists with IQs of 170, you can't create the IQ, right? It's a small market. The real power is in the data and the application of it in AI. So the big dollars today are in uh, BI. I mean, we've built a whole business up around uh, business intelligence, uh, definitely, you know, software. It's where all the data is, Dave. It's all the data is, exactly. But now the, the future is AI and, and those two worlds, I think I'm inferring from what you're saying are coming together. Um, and, and so where does, where do foundation models like GPT fit? Are they going to be writing Python code? Are they going to put analysts sort of out of business? Are they going to supercharge them? And where do they fit into your world, the semantic layer world? Right, they're, they're another source. Everything's fed into the semantic. So to the extent that that technology matures and broadens in its capability, it's only going to empower the semantic layer, which in turn is going to power everybody with the BI tool is getting at the benefit of that technology. So, What's the adoption look like? I said earlier, I mean, if you can get this adopted, that you're going to be in a very strong position in the industry. Uh, the, I would, the cloud guys don't want you owning the semantic layer, I presume, but what's the trajectory like? What's the uptake and adoption? So I would be, now I don't know what they tell you, but, but they tell me they love me. Why do they love me? For every dollar of semantic we sell, we drive $25 a compute. Ah, okay, so consumption but is we, a good thing. But we yeah. do it with a level of efficiency for the user that they can manage and get the value of, of that compute. So the customer loves us because they, they optimize their commute, com compute. The cloud vendors love us because those workloads are now driven to the cloud. And as you know, They've got the sword of Democles hanging over their heads. It's called that backlog. And it's called what? Wait, it's called, it's called what? Say it again. The sword of Democles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. See, but I shocked you. You I, thought I was just going to be profane and outrageous. You can be I can profane be and outrageous. That's cool too. I mean, you're well read. But so, okay, well, I get that. But, but it also Leave opens it this up. way, Dave. Remember the old days. And I'm feeling that way just because I turned 60 a couple weeks ago. Yeah, congratulations. Welcome to the club. Thank you. I made it. You look good. Thank you. Um, but back in the day, 
when we used to sell stuff that if you dropped on your foot, it broke your foot. Distributor warehouses were full of EMC storage and Cisco switches, right? And then the analysts would call in there to find out the backlog to know what was really sold. And that's how the stocks were shorted or long, et cetera. It's no different, right, with cloud compute. You book this stuff, right? You're gonna have to debook it at a certain point unless it's consumed. We help the customer consume the cloud and we help them consume it with an application that drives tremendous ROI. So we enable Google GCP, Databricks, Snowflake, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM to deliver a step function, more value to their customers with their platforms. And in a world where everyone's hiding under the table, no one has an appetite for experimenting, they have an appetite for ROI. We're bringing AI ROI because we bring applied AI. It's the only thing that matters. All of H2O. Um, Anaconda. You pick it. Uh, Any of these guys, right? Face. The challenge is they've sold to all the data scientists. They've worked with all the, the experimental data sets. The way those businesses are going to grow, data IQ, data robot, H2, any of them, the only way they can grow is through applied AI in the next two, three years. How do they do that? They connect to the semantic layer, multidimensional analysis powered by AI, and then delivered in a feature store for analysis by any BI user. That's how it's going to happen. That's how AI is going to be delivered to the to the to the business user in the Fortune 2000 and beyond. Um, and it's also what's going to make those companies I mentioned thrive again, right? I mean, it's you know it's well known that um, the growth rates have slowed. Um, I believe that's a temporary situation, and I'm already seeing evidence on how those companies are connecting the dots and figuring out how they connect business applications to AI. That's how it's going to be delivered in the next three to five years. And, you know, I can't speak for any of those companies. Obviously, I'm a strong investor in Data Robot, full disclosure, but I can tell you that if there's a person that understands this, it's Devonjen, and he's got the expertise to deliver it, which is, you know, why I recruited him into the company in the first place. So I believe that they're going to be the thought leaders in delivering applied AI, and you're seeing it in their messaging, and you're seeing it in the products that they're delivering in the roadmap. That's going to be the key, but it all, right, to get monetized has to run through that semantic layer because you need all the data, you need business context. So you, heard my, you heard my Uber example up front. Um, and the premise that we have is that everybody, because basically what that is, is it's a digital representation of their business and people, places, and things. And our premise is that everybody's going to want that. The problem is Uber had to go out and build that, you know, and it's pretty complicated architecture. Uh, and if it works for Uber, everybody is going to want a digital twin essentially of their business. And the, the premise is to do that, there's got to be a semantic layer. And so, but they can't be like, to 10 semantic layers. There's got to be sort of- only be one, Dave. Yeah, well, there's got to be well, one. Think so, about it. By definition, if it's universal, it then everybody's be. using it. Well, so how big can you get as a standalone company? I mean, can you- um, How big is the world of data? Big. Okay, I don't know. well, I mean, that's right. We, we, have, we have, I'm not going to be, look it, from a market standpoint, I'll compare myself to these companies. I'm not comparing myself to these people because I respect them and they've done stuff that in my opinion is incredible as business people. 
Um, I aspire to do it, but I'm not bold enough to say that I will. Time will tell. Um, you know, but, but I came out of, you know, venture semi-retirement back to a real job, a respectful job. Why? Because I want to leave the way I started. And you know, my career was really launched, not at digital, not at Wellfleet, not at Prominent, at Arrowpoint. Arrowpoint. Yeah, right. We commercialized the web. And now that's 25 years ago, I was there. And I'm going to commercialize data. I'm going to commercialize AI. And then I'm going to drop the mic. But then I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to put together a band and I'm going to go sing and have fun. But I'm getting this done first. I think it's a, well, we know it's a trillion dollar market. Can this company be a multi-billion dollar company? Of course it can. Am I the person to bring it there? I'm not going to say I am. But if, from a market standpoint, from a significant standpoint, this company is at least as significant as Snowflake, as Databricks, as Google GCP, any of those things. We are part of the ecosystem that drives the data revolution. That's interesting. So I mean, this, can be a, this can be a, you know, a game changer, right? right. But, all, I, but I just want to be clear so I don't, you don't get any hate on there. I'm not comparing myself to Ali or Frank, you know, or Thomas, or, you know, they're industry luminaries, you know, and they're far more sophisticated and talented than I am. The good news for me, I think you mentioned this at the beginning, I am one lucky motherfucker. <laughs> I say that. We were, I think we were talking off camera, right? You'd rather be lucky or smart. And we, I think we both agreed. You can, you can surround yourself with smart people, but better be lucky, don't you think? I, <laughs> I've had a great life being lucky and I feel very blessed and fortunate. Me too. And I'm a bull, I'm bullshit artist, but I don't believe my own bullshit. But you've seen a lot of waves. I want to, you mentioned Arrowpoint. I remember Arrowpoint. I was at IDC at the time and I was like, Wow, I don't think this company's going to make it. And the next thing you know, it was like sold for a lot of money. And uh, I think you had a lot to do with that. But but you've seen a lot of waves. I mean, so you go back to the sort of PC wave when I started in the business. I'm older than you are, but I sort of I was watching that as as an analyst. I got to start eating what you're eating. No, you you look awesome. You still doing the um, the intermittent fasting? Yes. How long do you go? I mean, I go 16, 18 sometimes. How long do you go? I eat once a day in a four hour window. I have dinner. So 20 hours you go. Correct. And then once a week, I do a full 24. People, and I feel amazing doing it. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, you're so much more focused, um, you know, when you're not- And I eat and drink what I want in that window and I can't put weight on. Yeah, yeah you, like I say, you look fantastic. But okay, so you saw, you. The PC wave, you obviously saw that, the, the internet, you guys, you capitalized on that. Um, you know, the, the, the cloud, big data, mobile, social wave, it was sort of, you know, the big data, you know, you and I, we spent a lot of time in that big data world, uh, but it sort of dissipated now. It went into the clouds, went into Snowflake, went into the Databricks, it's sort of, now it's a jump ball all over again. And now AI and generative AI comes in and it's kicked off this new wave. How big do you think this new wave is, given that you've seen a lot of them? Yeah, so I think this is the last wave, meaning I, I don't believe that, that the market for data and different ways to leverage it ever ends. And, and, and I don't think it ever slows. Why? Because anything that, that has a electrode run through it is creating data. People create data. We're always going to have more people. We're always going to have more things that are turned on that emit data. So the world of data never goes away. Um, that's why I think you see these tremendous valuations of, you know, of the companies I mentioned, the cloud companies. The way I think about it is the analog is the Databricks, the Snowflakes, you know, the Googles, the Amazons. They are, as cloud vendors, what the internet was. And if I have anything to say about it, at scale 
is going to be the arrow point of those clouds, meaning we're going to deliver the ROI that fuels those engines, right? How did the internet take off from an infrastructure perspective? It took off because applications started to get built on it. Applications like ArrowPoint, where you could deliver websites, right? And you could, you could do commerce through them. It changed the world. We don't think about it, right? But like, is there anybody on the planet that doesn't have a website? How many people have a website and don't do business through it in some way? Like, I don't, I don't know of many or any. So, and I think that this revolution is as significant, but I think it, it never dissipates because I don't think we're going to run out of ways or humans are going to run out of ways to think about how to use data. And if that's true, then, you know, this is the last frontier. I want to come back this to that. Cancer is going to be cured. It's all data. It's math. And, and I wish and, I could count without taking my socks and shoes off, but people, people, people talk about the singularity, you know, the machines go smarter than we are and then be our overlords. Are you worried about that? Um, I'm very worried. I mean, to me, when I think about data and AI, what's going on, there's a good, there's a bad, and there's an ugly. And we need to catch up from a legal perspective, from a societal perspective with this phenomenon. So I think the risk is, as humans, we're very unsophisticated in understanding the power of this. So I do think at its worst, the ugly is, you know, this is kind of like a nuclear weapon. It can be used to protect, it can be used to intimidate, it can be used to destroy. Well, you think the government can figure it out? I, I don't. Um, you know, well, I wouldn't hold my breath on that. Yeah, right? I mean, but you, look, like any revolution, it's, it's about the people. We have to do it. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the industry has to self-regulate. Self I think there's motivation to do that. Um, did you like being a VC? Um, Paul Ferry, the founder of Matrix, you know, one of the most long-standing and, and successful venture firms in the world. He was a mentor. He put me in Wellfleet, Prominent, Arrow Point, et cetera. When I went to do venture, he said, Chris, you're going to hate it. You're too impatient. Uh, you're too much a control freak. Um, and you're used to being the boss. You're going to have partners, and partners are for dancing. And I still did it, but he was right. So that's one dimension of it. The second is that being a venture capitalist, they won't admit it, right? Because they want to see themselves as they want to see themselves, but they're voyeurs. They're students of the game. They're watching, right? So for me, I'd rather be the star of the movie than the executive producer. But you're still so an venture, investor. If you're doing, you're, well, you're, you're an executive producer. Right. You're not the star. They think they are, they're not. The star is the entrepreneur. The star at At Scale is Dave Mariani. It's not me. You know, right? I, I, and I, I like the founders the way. of these companies that create the ideas and are bold enough to bring them to market. That's what changes the world, right? The money is the money. Someone's got to put it in. Right, but the hard yards are the entrepreneur, and they should get all the credit. You've always, you've always, really respected the entrepreneur, the the technical, you know, founders. Um, but let me ask you, as a as an investor, you know, the, a lot of VCs are actually probably all VCs are really excited right now because they think they can start companies. You see, it all the Series C money go, you know, growth capital is drying up, and it's all going to sort of early early stage. And, and the excitement is around, I could start a company for short money, a bunch of people get laid off, a bunch of smart people. I could start a company, get an MVP really quickly. Um, do you think that is actually going to, I mean, it's going to spawn new stuff, but is that the right play now? Or is that just, 
you know, VCs getting excited because they don't have to put as much capital in. How do you think about, I mean, you work with a lot of young entrepreneurs, people, you, you mentor a lot of people. What do you see with, with early stage kind of AI startups right now? So, um, I think, it, you know, there's a frenzy for sure as you're, as you're intimating. Um, you know, I think, it, I think it's part of an overhyped cycle, right? So fundamentally, I think it's an excellent time to invest. I'm investing. Why? Because prices are low. There's quality talent out there and everyone's come to earth in terms of their expectations financially. Um, and these companies, if you see the company today, they're probably getting their sea legs two or three years from now. And, you know, I do think that people have short memories and the markets will come back and, you know, we'll go back to value and growth over profitability and all the dumb things we've done that got us here. So yeah. fundamentally investing is a good time. I think it's a great time to buy companies because you can get great value. And if you've got the balance sheet to do it, you know, the companies that are going to win and come out of this, the companies that are aggressive, screw it. So good, good time to start a company. I think that should happen. You agree? It's a good time to start a company? It's a great time to start a company. That said, what you asked me was about venture people investing, you know, in all these AI startups. I'm going to bring you get again back since I'm sort of nostalgic. Think about back in the day, optical switching. Mm -hmm. How many optical switches were invested in, in Boston, right? And then when the crash happened, they all went out of business. There was a big hole in the ground that the VCs dumped their money, right? You're going to lose your money when you follow. You make money when you lead. So I'll leave it at that. So you turned 60 this year, um, just recently. April 22nd, I'm a Taurus. Happy, happy belated birthday. So. What I heard you say is you want to see this through, and then and then what? You you're gonna just become an investor? You're gonna kick? I can't ever see you stopping working. I had my um, 28th wedding anniversary in January. Now, of course, like me, my time is terrible. So um, my daughter Nora got me a nice rest, uh, French restaurant reservation, and because I'm a knucklehead, I decided to on that night, my anniversary, to tell my lovely wife that I'm never retiring. I'm going to follow the sun after this, but I'm never retiring. I mean, what would I retire to? This is my life's work. It's my love. Um, but I have to do it differently. And I do think that it's time for me, after at scale, is at a point where um, the value of the company and the significance of it is commensurate with what's been built. Um, it'll be time for me to um, take some of these people that I've been working with for years and let them show what they can do. I'll stay involved, I'll invest, you know, I'll chair them, but not in an operating role. I want to be the cheerleader, you know, for this army of entrepreneurs that know how to be successful, know how to do it playing by their own rules. Um, and once they do it, they have the moral fiber to understand that they were fortunate, they were lucky and pay it forward. And in turn, teach another generation of entrepreneurs how to do it and how to do it right and how to live right. So, so that's you, the mission. So what do you, that's awesome. What, what do you look for in a young entrepreneur? I mean, everybody wants people that are smart. Of course, you've surrounded yourself with a lot of smart people, but what are the qualities that you look for in a, in a young entrepreneur that you say, I want to invest in that person? Character, um, integrity, work ethic, and X factor. And the X is the wanted factor. And you'd be surprised how many people I run into and, and where I run into them. I'll give you one example. There's a young man, and we'll make sure he gets this. His name is Robin Pena. P-E-N-A. He's a Dominican immigrant. He came to this country with nothing. Um, long story short, he and his mom ended up on their own. 
He was a cleaner at St. Seb's, where my youngest goes, Junior, who also performs at Tech Tackles Cancer with uh, Johnny Fingers Lynch. And by the way, shout out to Fewer Storage and Infididot, um, who are big supporters and performers. And as you mentioned, they actually can sing. But in any event- HPE we're too, right? HPE, right? Does an HPE yes. participate? Yep, let's not forget those guys. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Awesome. All right, where was I? I lost my train of thought. I'm all, you, were, you, were, you, were, you were sharing with me the qualities of, a, of an entrepreneur oh, that you want to invest and, in. Yeah, and this, so, so this kid, he's a cleaner at night at St. Seb's. The, the head of security, not head of security, one of the security guys leaves. He walks up to the headmaster and he says, if you give me one of those red shirts and hire me, I already got the keys and I know what to do because he had the keys because he cleaned the school. They gave him the job and with the benefits, he put himself through Bunker Hill in computer science. He then got a scholarship and he starts in September at BU for computer science. And I've seen this kid for the last couple of years, you know, I dropped Junior off when I'm in town, freezing cold, rain, he's out there. The security guy that used to be there, you know, had the crack of his ass hanging out his pants and had a puss on his face. This guy opened every door for the kid, big smile, high-fiving the parents. He connected with everybody. He's telling me the story, and I'm like, dude, you're an at scaler. Ah. <laughs> I'm going to be on Team Lynch. He was in here this week, so we're bringing him in this summer. He's going to be one of our interns. And that guy, that young man, I don't know how old he is, but probably early 20s, he can be a CEO, right? Why do I do the stuff I do, Dave? It's simple. I'm trying to show the world, if I can do this, anybody can do it, right? The powers that be want to think that, you know, you have to go to the right school. You know, you have to be a 42 long. You have to be something, you know? And I know that sometimes they're not pro politically correct, but I love people, all people. And the message I have for everybody is, you can be who you are, you can be yourself, and you can win on your own terms. And I don't have to talk about it. I do it. I, it's true. I mean, I've known you for a long time. Uh, you know, you do piss a lot of people off. Or you, I think you, you know, I think you scare a lot of people because you're so unpredictable. I mean, I, I remember I was at a, a VC meetup. It was pre-COVID, and you know, I dropped your name because you're my friend, and and I thought this guy would know you, and he was like, oh, like he kind of ran away from me. I'm like, you're a dick. And so, oh. Sorry. So I was like, oh, that's, but I didn't, you know, it's funny because I know you and I love you. I didn't, I didn't, I should know, but I, I didn't realize the reaction that some people have toward you. But then you think about it, you do, you, you don't really care what people think of you, do you? Well, here's why they don't like me. I proved that I could do their job better than them. You look at my track record as an investor. You don't have to look any further than Data Robot or threat stack or data camp or Newtonian, right? And I'm just a dumbass from Suffolk University. I don't have the pedigree. I don't have the discipline. I'm not articulate. I'm not handsome, but I work my ass off. I care about people. And I've been selling to the same hundred people and companies for nearly 40 years. <laughs> Because I do what I say I'm going to do. And that scares the hell out of them because they don't want everyone to know that anybody can do it. And everybody should do it. You know, it's funny, Chris, because you, you do care Except about people. Nobody's definition of you but your own. You, you, you do care about people. You, you know, you, you often ask me about, how's that guy who used to, you remember Jeff Kelly, our big yeah. data guy? And I sort of took him under my wing and he, you know, he took off and he did great. And he's, you know, working, I don't know, AWS right now, but he's making more money than he would have made working for me. And, uh, but you always ask about him and you remember him. You always ask about family and you don't, it's not just a throwaway, you actually care. Um, and I think that's who you are. Um, but, you know, let people think what they want, I guess. I, I want to ask you something about, I've never been to the Middle East. You've been there a bunch, 
lately. Uh, my understanding is the investment climate there is really interesting. They're trying to recreate themselves because they got oil locked up obviously and energy, but they really see the future uh, as technology and they kind of, they really haven't been huge participants in the last wave, but they'd like to be in the next wave. What's going on over there? You've been there a lot lately, haven't you? Sure. So it's super interesting. I'm glad you asked me about it. So I've been there to the region four times in the last 14 months. Prior to that, I had not been there in 25 years since Arrow Point. It is a different world. The advances they're making socially are amazing. And, it, and, it, and, and it's great to see. So that's one. Two, um, they don't want to participate. They want to lead it. And I'm here to tell you, the world of data, the world of AI, it's the new frontier. Nobody owns it. It's anybody's. And obviously I'm a American. I can tell you that if we don't get our act together as a country, this industry of ours that you and I grew up in, that gave us so much and so others so much, it's gonna go the way of the Buffalo. Like manufacturing and steel, like textiles, right? You remember my old company, Ecopia, that we sold to F5. Sure. Lowell, Massachusetts. Right? Think about Lowell. What died in Lowell? What was created and died in Lowell? The that textile Textiles, industry. exactly, yep. The mini computer industry, where we started. Yep. Remember Wang? Where's Wang? Well, yep. guess what? If we don't get our act together, there's... In the world of data, right, there is no such thing as geography or proximity, which means anybody can do it if you aggregate the assets and the assets of the data soldiers, and they have the money to accumulate them. Yeah. And they have the ambition to it. And then last and not least, remember what I said, it's about the data stupid. Well, guess what? Their biggest, 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 biggest advantage is they have the data and they have no restriction on using the data inside the kingdom. That's going to power the ability to drive use cases, which I think will invoke the influence pyramid and drive the rest of the world to follow them if they want to keep up. So that's their ambition. And I don't see any reason why they couldn't do it. And, you know, we should absolutely make it a horse race. But they have the vision, very sophisticated, and they're importing all the assets, the people. Yeah, there is no entitlement. And John Chambers talks about that all the time. He used to work at Wang. Wang, Prime, DG, Digital, all gone, yeah. right? And so the way of the Buffalo. That's, well, and you know, and part of it, Chris, is the, the public-private partnership in the US is deteriorating. Correct. Uh, it, it's, it's terrible. I mean, Lena Khan wants to attack every technology, you know, big tech company, thinks the government has the right answers. Um, the government- How many technologists do we know, I'm not going to embarrass them, right? But like, you know, a guy like Steve Papa made his living yeah. in Massachusetts, not to pick on him, but we'll pick on him. And then he moves up to New Hampshire, right? Why does he do that? And by the way, I like him. I think it's a loss. Now, I know he, he dips his toe over here, but, you know, at the end of the day, this is not a, a pro-business state. And they're making it very difficult. Look what's happened in California. Yeah, they're driving people out. They're and and, and on, our, on, our, on a national level, look what we're doing. I can tell you that there's unity in the Middle East on the mission. And we don't have that. We don't have it within a state, never mind the United States or even you know, with our allies. You know, we're missing the boat. Yeah, we are missing, it's, it's I'm right, you're wrong. No, I'm right, you're wrong. And there's there's no compromise, but there's no consistency in the agenda. Okay, 
they're going to throw $50 billion at the CHIPS Act. Okay, yeah, that's nice, but then we're going to block ARM. Well, that's only because what's, what's your name had stock in it. Yeah, yeah, but then we're going to block ARM be, be being acquired by NVIDIA. What's her name? Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi, yeah, that's right. I want to see her carbon footprint, by the way. She's <laughs> flying around in a jet we're paying for. <laughs> But you know what I'm saying, right? I mean, hey, but pardon the pun. Go ahead. We do have to fix this. And uh, Nancy, we got to put the hammer down. Yeah. Just not on your husband. Ouch. <laughs> and that's why people love you, Chris Lynch. <laughs> you still say what you think. All right, I got to let you go. This is I. I this was awesome. Uh, uh oh, have, did I get you in trouble? No, God, no. No, you, hey, this is. All this I care is if, if Furrier is laughing. If he's laughing, I'm happy. I don't even think he knows that I'm talking to you. He's going to have FOMO. He's going to be pissed that I didn't invite him in. <laughs> I took the whole mic, eat the minutes. So have a great trip to London. Good luck. Um, Thank you. And let's get together in June. I miss you, buddy. Yeah, me too, man. Love you. All right. I right, love you too. Take care. Thanks a lot. We'll see you later. Damn. All right. Thank you for watching. This is Dave Vellante. We'll see you next time.